possible that some of you watching tonight have yet to read anything by the brilliant British author Douglas Murray. Possible but highly improbable, I'd suggest, since Murray's invaluable insights into the cultural and political madness of our time appear frequently in many publications that you and I respect. His book, The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, Islam, spent almost 20 weeks on the Sunday Times bestseller list when it was published in 2017 and has been published in more than 20 languages. His latest work, The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Race and Identity, exposes the new ideology that uh, forms the creed of the new modern left. It was the most important book I'd read in a decade, I felt, last year when, when I read it when it first came out. Murray's insights into identity politics, online shaming, intersectionality, cancel culture, all those things of the modern woke world map out the dark terrain on which the battle of ideas is being fought. Douglas Murray joins us from London. Doug, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to Water Cooler. It's very good to be with you. Douglas, you wrote in the Madness of Crowds last year, we are going through a great crowd derangement in public and in private, both online and off, people are behaving in ways that are increasingly irrational, feverish, herd like and simply unpleasant. In the light of everything that's happening now, you must have some grim feeling of vindication. Sadly, they have, yes. Uh, uh, earlier this year, when the COVID uh, crisis hit, I had a moment, as I'm sure a lot of us did, where I thought maybe the sort of craziest bits of identity politics and more are going to take a back seat. You know, maybe now we've all got some serious issues to worry about. Maybe unserious issues will bother us and detain us a little less. Uh, I thought, you know, now, now at the very least, even if we don't all get ill and die, um, you know, our living standards is going to decline and, and much more. And I thought, well, in that case, we'll all have real complaints and we won't have so much time for people with totally fraudulent and made up complaints. You know, in a time where actual aggression feels like it might be growing, uh, um, uh, microaggressions might, might take a back seat. And that was my view early on in the crisis, the COVID crisis. And then I just saw that whole thing blow right up. And in fact, what has been revealed in recent months is that what I describe in the Madness of Crowds uh, seems to have just gone on steroids for the last three or four months. And it's, um, it's both vindicating what I say in the Madness of Crowds and very worrying for me because what I say in that book, as you know, is, is really in part a warning. It's, it's an attempt to, to decontaminate an area of or a lot of areas of thought that have been willfully contaminated by dishonest and disingenuous actors and unfortunately uh, it seems that those dishonest and disingenuous actors in all of our countries have been having the time of their lives. You describe the increasing speed with which this movement rolls on with every, ever greater absurdities things that were perfectly okay five minutes ago are suddenly hanging in fences. The COVID-19 crisis seems to have accelerated the madness even more. Yes, well, there, there is a, there is a, I wrote about this early on in the crisis, that I was very worried immediately by the way in which there seemed to be a policing of the boundaries, not just of discussion, but of investigation that seemed to me very troubling. Uh, I was alarmed, for instance, that uh, there were uh, groups, including think tanks and investigatory bodies who were saying, um, these are the things that should be looked into and these are the things that should not. There's a think tank that claims to study extremism in, the Lo in London, where I am, uh, which immediately said that it is a conspiracy theory to claim that the uh, virus may have come from a laboratory. Uh, and, and I was just shocked, amazed at the way in which so fast on such a huge issue, there was the, the attempt we've seen on lots of other issues, but attempt on a sort of brand new issue to just box in what should be looked at and should be said, and should be thought about. Uh, I am very, very opposed to that on this issue as on any other. I'm, I'm always for the widest possible discussion. 
because I always suspect that if you have the widest possible discussion, you've got the largest chance of getting to the truth. And that if you allow people to box things off and say, you can't say this, you can't think about that, you've got a disproportionate likelihood of unnecessarily hurtling yourself and your society into error. And I do think that's something that has been going on in this crisis, as in the ones I write about in the book. Let's try and put the madness of crowds in context, Doug, if we may, and understand where this cultural arrogance began. You set up your book with a pertinent observation by the late Ken Minogue about the progressive urge to slay dragons. Um, it's as if they see themselves as St George setting out to eradicate horrible evils to turn the world into a better place. Uh, the interesting thing for me is that Ken wrote that book almost 60 years ago. Yes, I, I'm a, 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 a great admirer of, of Ken Minogue and uh, his thought, of course, a very distinguished Australian-born philosopher. And I'm privileged to know him a bit in his later life. Just a wonderful man, great, great guy to be with. And uh, he, in his book, The Liberal Imagination, I think it was, mm. uh, used this analogy. I mean, one of Ken's geniuses, it seemed to me always, was that he, he, he had that skill that we used to associate with philosophy and thought, which was the skill to take highly complex ideas and make them understandable. Um, uh, this, of course, is exactly the opposite of the, of the current age, where the idea of anyone involved in ideas is to take really quite straightforward ideas and concepts and make them sound completely unintelligible. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, you know, Ken had that first skill in abundance. And in, in that book, he refers to George in retirement syndrome as being one of the risks that liberalism can end up in. And, and, I, and I, I credit this to him, I, and I, I extend the metaphor. What Minogue was saying was that, that liberalism had within it this tendency to, to keep on searching for causes to fight in order to justify its existence, so that it could end up... Uh, um, like St. George in retirement, that is that St. George got so much credit for slaying the dragon that he might be tempted to go around the land looking for other dragons to slay. And if there are a paucity of dragons, he might find himself uh, swinging his sword at ever smaller creatures until eventually one day St. George might be found swinging his sword at thin air. And um, I, I believe, I, I explained that, I think that uh, what Minogue said then very, very prescient and accurate, is, is absolutely what has happened to the liberal mind in the last few decades and recent years. And, and the redux is something like this, and I see it very clearly in Australian society. I haven't been there for about, I think, 18 months, but uh, um, I follow events fairly closely there. And I think in Australia, as in Britain and America, what you have is a type of rampaging liberal who wants desperately to be uh, the sort of person who gets your claim that, say, people did who were at the Stonewall Inn in 1968, uh, or were joining Martin Luther King in the March on Washington, or were the suffragettes. And uh, these may all be very good things to have been. And our society says, you know, how much we admire the people involved in these various liberal uh, liberation causes. Uh, the thing is, of course, is that uh, uh, today, the people who want to be deemed to have exactly that amount of uh, virtue, to have been exactly that good and involved in those good causes, are at best um, sort of staggering around the land looking for chickens to machete. Uh, uh, um, and, uh, um, and in actual fact, I think in most cases, swinging their swords at thin air. You know, the gay press, such as it is in all of our countries, is left, you know, trying desperately to find some regional politician who once said something on social media that wasn't totally in accord with 2020's views about gays. Um, uh, you know, the, the, they, they, they're desperate to find misogynists, absolutely desperate for it. And then you have this, what I've always described as one of the oddest things of our age, which is that the fact that the desire to find racism uh, uh, is in very disproportionate uh, um, 
context to the actual extent in which we have racism in our societies. Thank goodness our societies are, are, are not racist. Certainly they're not tolerant of racism. And so we have what I've always described as this supply and demand problem where the, the so-called anti-racists have a huge demand for racists. There's just not that much of a supply of them. Um, and, uh, and that's a problem for them uh, because these enemies give their lives meaning and the the vindication they feel if they can be claimed to be within the orbit of the great human rights uh, um, protesters and causes it, it gives their lives purpose so i think and i think this has become a perversity of modern liberalism as ken minogue warned that we have people swinging their swords at thin air we should, of course, address the semantic confusion over the word, word liberal. Uh, in Australia, being a liberal is on, to be on the side of sanity. I think you're talking about liberals in the American sense here. Yes, yes. This term shifts. It's, it's one of several big terms in our day which shape shifts uh, uh, according to which continent you're on. But yes, indeed. I mean, uh, by the way, I should stress, I mean, I, I've always thought of liberalism as a good thing to be in the classical sense. I approve of liberalism. I, I regard myself as a classical liberal. But yes, the form of liberalism I'm describing there is, the, is what we re really end up having to call leftism. I think if Martin Luther King was uh, to make his famous I have a dream speech today, he'd probably be immediately cancelled on Facebook for posting incorrect thoughts. Uh, he, he famously said, of course, that people should not be judged by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. And now it appears the colour of your skin is all that matters. We have indeed, uh, I say, in the madness of crowds, it's taken half a century for Martin Luther King's disciples to completely invert his dream. Uh, we actually have figures like the deeply sinister, deeply sinister, fraudulent, I think, figure, Robin DiAngelo, an American academic, who happens to be white, by the way, who, with her book, White Fragility, um, has actually gone around the country in America giving lectures, saying, that what matters most is the color of your skin and that actually people who start talking about the content of character rather than skin color are to use one of the terms of the jargon of the age problematic In exactly 50 years we go from martin luther king to this crock fraud uh, robin d'angelo hawking this idea that robin uh, that the that, 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 that uh, robin d'angelo is that martin luther king's totally wrong and that what matters is skin color, not the content of character. And this is, this is of course, this is extraordinary perversity about this. Um, because as I see it, and as I've tried to warn people, you, you, you either have Martin Luther King's dream, or you've got hell when it comes to race relations. Uh, and if I can explain that one of the reasons for that isn't just uh, philosophical, it, is, it isn't just moral. It is, and I warn people, try to warn people about it, it's deeply practical. I mean, in a country like my own, in Britain, let alone the United States, uh, um, the white population is the majority. And I don't think that it is sustainable for a bullying, vociferous minority who happen to be black or white or any other color to go around telling majority populations that they are wicked and evil and have nothing good about themselves and to do so in the name of anti-racism and to say that some people are better than them because of the color of their skin. This is, this is something which I uh, have, have been deeply worried about seeing. And I saw it incidentally when I was in Australia uh, uh, last, some before last, uh, um, I did a, a tour uh, around a number of Australian cities and I noticed that there as much as here, you have this idea, for instance, of certain things can be said by certain people by dint of their tr character traits or characteristics and cannot be said by other people. This is what I describe in the Madness of Crowds as the problem of the speaker, not the speech, that we've become almost uninterested in what uh, uh, the content of somebody's speech is, like we've become less interested in the content of their character. It's all about who the speaker is. It's why people say speaking as a, and then, you know, always give some trait they believe qualifies them to speak. And, and this is just a small example of something that Dr. King was saying, no, 
it would be the content of your words, just like it would be the content of your character that would matter. It, it shouldn't be necessary for people to stand up and say, speaking as a, in order to justify whether what they're about to say is of worth or not. And it's deeply, deeply uh, mistaken as a long-term strategy, because as I say, majority populations, I believe, will not tolerate being told, basically, shut up. And so I, I, I warn about this, but I, I feel like I've warned about it uh, without effect, because in the time since I first wrote this, people have just stampeded exactly down the dangerous, disastrous path that I'm trying to warn against. Martin Luther King Jr. also insisted that black people should be good citizens, that civil rights couldn't be separated from civil responsibilities to obey the law, pay one's taxes, have a citizenly regard for others. Uh, Harvey Milk, uh, the, the, the leader of the Stonewall movement, uh, made similar arguments about the rights of gay citizens. The Black Lives Matter movement, on the other hand, is very different. It's about burning and looting cities ripping the social fabric apart, if you like, rather than making it stronger. Yes. Well, well, that, as I warn about, I think, I think I may be the first writer to have pointed this out. In my, as you know, I take these identity issues one by one. I do, I do gay first because mm. it's the one crampon I have on the wall of social justice theory. Not that I get any credit for it, of course, for my opponents. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I, I say in the gay chapter that opens the book, uh, there was always a strand in gay liberation, uh, gay rights, which presented being gay as uh, not just something that, I, well, as I think of it as being just something some people are, and it's a really rather uninteresting characteristic, um, but actually as a foundational thing from which a whole political um, uh, project then emerges. So uh, this is what I describe as the gay and queer divide. Gays just want to basically get on with their lives and 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 uh, you know do all the same things everyone else does, and uh, queers uh, believe that uh, being gay is just the first uh, step, and then after that you've got to bring down capitalism and introduce Marxism and a whole load of other stuff. And and I, I mean most gay people are not on board for that project, but there was always a, a radical fringe who thought that was the point, and it's the same thing in feminist theory. I take on in the second chapter in the Madness of Crowds the relations between the sexes, and I partly do it because, you know, I, I mean, I, I think it's totally impossible that we have this situation where men are not allowed to ever talk about women. I mean, I, I, I have this really old fashioned view uh, that, that, that the sexes have got to get on. <laughs> it's probably good for the future of our species that they do, or at least find some kind of compromise. And it can't be this dangerous, cancelling for men and women to, 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 to talk about the relations between the sexes. And we have always had a problem, though, because just like in gay, there's always been a problem where some feminists have believed that it's not enough just for women to have equal rights. It's not enough for women to be able to pursue whatever it is that they wish to pursue in their lives. A very, very laudable aim. Most, almost all people agree with this. But there was always a strand in feminism that said, no, no, uh, the job of women is then to, to bring down a whole load of stuff, to bring down patriarchy and the family and capitalism and Marxism and you get the drift, it's all part of the same pattern. And there are always people who said this in equal rights on racial matters and other things. And I say these people in each of these realms should be regarded with, with very, very great suspicion and should have been pushed back against a lot more. In each of these cases, there are people and campaigns who have used uh, the call for equality, whether it's LGBT equality or equality within sexes or racial equality, have used these traits in order to try to, to, to use them as a battering ram to smuggle in behind it a very clear and consistent political and social policy. And I think that conservatives in particular in every country have been very, very slow on the uptake of identifying that's what it is. Uh, it's been going on very clearly in recent months where uh, Black Lives Matter have been using the totally laudable call for racial equality, equal racial rights, equal treatment under the law and much more, and have been smuggling just behind the front phalanx of that BLM's core 
desires, including the bringing down of capitalism, the introduction of Marxism, and much more. And these are disastrous things to wind up alongside each other, of course, because you can get majority populations in all of our properly liberal countries like Australia and Britain behind each of these rights claims. You can get majority populations behind each of them. We do not live in a uh, deeply, you know, uh, homophobic societies. We don't live in deeply anti-female societies or misogynist societies. We do not live in deeply racist societies. And people know that and they have the decency and they want equality. But the minute that these things all get tied up with completely radical attempts to disorientate and then destroy the societies that we live in, you lose people. And that's why I, I call anybody in these movements to, to get these things separated, to separate out the radicals, the Marxists, the anarchists from any legitimate rights claims. Douglas, you see, as I do, a religious element in this movement. Uh, I hesitate to use the word religion because for me that devalues the, uh, the positive religious faiths that are part of our community. But a sociologist would recognise many of the same functions in woke faith, if you like. It, it, it's a way of binding people together with a shared world view and excluding uh, the apostates. Yes, yes. To, to that extent, by the way, I've come to the conclusion that it would be better described as a cult. Uh, 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 I agree that Durkheim, in, uh, you know, lens th through which to understand it is probably a, a, a useful one. But by this stage, we're talking much more about cult-like behaviors than we are religious behaviors. The religious behaviors are not just the binding issues, but the fact that we have so many spillovers from organized religion that appear to be manifesting in these social justice movements. I'm thinking particularly of things like the desire to atone, uh, the, the, the desire to alleviate guilt, uh, the, the attempt to impose guilt and feelings of guilt on others. Um, uh, uh, this and much more very recognizable, particularly recognizable from what one might call spilt Christianity. If you use T.E. Hume's famous uh, description of romanticism. And, and it, it is spilt, this is really spilt Christianity we're dealing with in parts of the social justice movements. Uh, and you see that sometimes, by the way, completely openly. There were, there were scenes in American streets in June, July, where people were, white people were actually flogging themselves in the street. And black people were coming over and trying to stop them, saying, we don't want this, brother. We don't want you to do this. And, and these white maniacs. Are uh, like bleeding or welted on their backs. You think, wow. I mean, I, I mean, you can see that occasionally with Shia, uh, you know, um, uh, religious festivals. But I thought, I thought I wouldn't expect that from like white Americans. But here we are with something. As I say, you know, our society has really hadn't seen since the Middle Ages, and um, and so those those sorts of things say yes. There's an obviously religious uh, type of spilt religion here. The reason I say it's actually cult-like is because the further the social justice thing goes along, the more you can see cult-like traits. For instance, the call to separate from your family if your family do not have the right views. Increasingly, you know, your grandparents are racist and if they do not get with the project, you must break off from your grandparents. I mean, by the way, this, these are wicked, wicked things to say wicked wicked things to do to try to split up families like this can you imagine anything more more upsetting for a grandparent than for their grandchild to come back from college and and tell them you've got the wrong ideas grandma grandpa and so we can't see you anymore i mean it's really disgusting on a human level what's being taught at the moment but these sorts of traits the call to for companies and others to pay tithes you know, give over a portion of your income to the approved group. The, the, this is cult-like behavior. We, we would recognize this in any other context. And I'm surprised it's taken us so long to recognize it with these people. But they should be called out for this by now. Yeah, but the thing is, it's repentance without forgiveness, isn't it? I mean, there are many examples of people in your book who are hounded by the offense seekers on Twitter for incorrect thoughts. But uh, no matter how much they grovel, they can never 
redeem themselves in the eyes of their accusers. I'm thinking, for instance, of that, that poor old Benedict Cumberbatch, who you mentioned in your book. Uh, he foolishly used the term coloured actors, if I remember correctly, when what he should have said, of course, was actors of colour. Well, well, he, he had an advantage, because poor old Benedict... Um... Uh, there were two things. By the way, I mean, the, the, the thing he was attacked for was, was just fantastically ludicrous, even by the standards of our highly ludicrous age. Uh, I mean, he referred to, to coloured people when that month's uh, thing was people of colour in America. It, it was acceptable to say coloured people still in Britain. And by the way, the NAACP, the National Association for Coloured People in America, hasn't changed its name. So uh, a, a different standard was being applied, not for the first time. Uh, depending on the speaker. But the other thing, of course, was that Benedict Cumberbatch did have an advantage, which is he had a big PR team around him, as all you know, mega-famous, mega-rich Hollywood actors do. Uh, most people aren't in that situation. And uh, if they misspeak by saying something that this week you're not meant to say, even if the NAACP is still called the thing you're not meant to say, um, you uh, most likely just find the whirlwind coming at you and you don't know what's hit you and it's all over and you haven't got a PR team and by the time you scramble to get any help, you're, you're, you know, you're totally unsalvageable. Um, so yes, this, this, is a, this is one of the most ridiculous trends of the age. And by the way, the one that can be pushed back at most, I've developed a, um, a, a, a serious a lack of sympathy for prominent figures who complain about things they're not allowed to say, because I honestly think that our generation is the luckiest generation in history. Every single thing our forebears did before us contained far more risk than anything any of us have to face in our lives. All we have to do is speak and speak the truth as we see it. And I'm just struck by the fact that the bullies, and it's just nothing more complex than that, the bullies in the social justice movement have persuaded adult after adult to shut up, not to speak. And it's pathetic. I think, and I don't think we have to go along with it. I don't see any reason why we do. We, sh we could be more organized. We could be cleverer, definitely, in avoiding certain traps. But there's no way that adults in positions of power and indeed people without any position in our societies should be this fearful of using language and of discussing ideas. And that's why I say in the madness of crowds, I say, you know, I identify all these. We've got to be able to talk about LGBT. We've got to be able to talk about men and women. We've got to be able to talk about race. And we shouldn't have them feel like every time any of us in our private or professional lives goes on to any of these really interesting and important subjects, we are dealing with an like, imminent death scenario. It shouldn't be like that. So let's talk about the lurch to authoritarianism, which is a notable characteristic of Black Lives Matter uh, and similar movements. Uh, you may have seen in the state of Victoria right now, we essentially have an authoritarian state government uh, ruled by the chief health officer who has the power to send in the police into your home without a warrant and authorise dis the destruction of your property, the confiscation of your property. And uh, the police, of course, have been using this with enormous enthusiasm. Uh, I mean, last week they arrested a pregnant woman in her pyjamas in her own kitchen for a Facebook post. Is that part of this uh, growing authoritarianism you warn about? I think there is some overlap. Uh, I think the COVID thing is, 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 is different in that uh, every, every time the police in any of our countries get given extra powers, there are always people within them who will abuse them. Uh, we had that in the UK, certainly early on in the COVID crisis, I think it's still going on to some degree now. But the very beginning in the UK, we had things like, you know, uh, police telling people not to play in their own gardens, you know, um, uh, I, I, yeah, actually the, the public health advice of the government didn't say, don't play in your own garden. Um, but you get police who misinterpret or don't understand. Uh, and of course, you get uh, ones who want to overreach. There's always going to be a certain portion of people in the police force who uh, are, are absolutely thrilled at new powers that come their way. Um, I'm never particularly thrilled at such powers because I think that always the police misuse them. I think of things like the manner in which counter-terrorism legislation in my own country was, was used 
uh, for totally other purposes. You know, we had a case where a council once used counter-terrorism legislation to find people putting their bins out on the wrong night, you know. And, and I say this not because it's a ludicrous example, but because it's an absolutely typical example of what happens. Police overreach, the use of powers once given for other purposes. But I, I yeah, you, you know a lot about more, more about this than I do, but I've watched this case in Victoria and others there uh, with considerable concern because I, I actually, I underestimated the extent to which at the beginning of the COVID crisis, the sort of public health overreach was gonna occur. I thought that there would be a, um, a much more reasonable uh, uh, understanding of what the limits were. And uh, I was wrong on that. I mean, I, I think that by now it's becoming clear that there are going to have to be much, much clearer strictures about police overreach than there are. Uh, we've had it in the UK, uh, police officers, you know, really overreacting uh, on video with people, you know, caught not wearing a mask on a basically empty train carriage and this sort of thing. Uh, we are going to have to get these delineations right um, because uh, you know for the immediate future uh, the health officials um, uh, are working in effectively a sort of um, a magisterium akin to the magisterium that the law existed in until quite recently you know a totally uh, and indeed science uh, a, a totally unopposable uh, um, uh, uh, system you know this is the one you can't argue against now public health uh, and we should be worried about that were you surprised that the scientific debate about something as serious as a pandemic uh, quickly became dragooned into this culture war I, I don't think it happened that quickly i think it's taken a little time to clarify so that now there is a clear political delineation it seems that broadly speaking, I think I'm right in saying this is the same in, in Australia, but certainly in America and Britain, the um, broadly speaking, the left remains, for instance, very pro mask and the right is a bit more skeptical of masks. And there is obviously a civil liberties angle to this. I think there are other things going on. And I think we probably can't ignore the extent to which there's spillovers of the specific cultural situation that America is in at the moment. You know, one of, the, one of the things that Black Lives Matter shows is, uh, you know, a reminder that American culture war issues spill over into every other English speaking country in particular with extraordinary force very fast. You know, I mean, the British police don't have the problems the American police do, but we get the protests anyway. And I think it's the same with the divisions over the COVID uh, uh, political divisions. In America, the political divisions are clear and they are clear and have been throughout. Whereas, I mean, again, in Britain and like Australia, there was a degree of political unanimity from the beginning. In America, there was not at any stage political unanimity because America is in an election year and a number of Democrats uh, uh, saw that this was a means to get Donald Trump out of office. And so at this stage, everything, including the wearing of masks or the non-wearing of masks, is a deeply political issue, a politicized issue. And it's all down to what happens in November. I mean, I honestly believe that there are Democrats, for instance, who are, who are actually um, content with continuing to crash the American economy because they believe it's the best means to get Donald Trump out of office in a few months' time. And um, I think that versions of that argument, versions of that political divide, that right-left divide, have spilt out into all of our countries. But there is also obviously an underlying um, issue where people on, on the right have a certain proportion of the right, libertarian right, you might say in particular, have always been skeptical of government and further government overreach uh, because they, they believe they know where, where that always goes. But yes, it, it, it has politicized. Uh, and, and I think these, these are two, at least, of the main reasons why. Talking about cancel culture, look, can you explain, Douglas, from your point of view in London, why Tony Abbott, our erstwhile former Prime Minister, with great accomplishments to his name in the, form of trade, in the, in the field of trade, has become you know, a figure of hate for the British media? All sorts of uh, horrible and untrue things are, have been said about him in the last couple of weeks. What on earth is going on? It's, uh, it's just the craziest thing that's happened in the last few days. Uh, 
can I give a quick example before this happened? We've been a weird, weird culture war example of this for some time in the UK. We had it with my late friend Roger Scruton uh, 18 months mm. ago or so when the government here tried to appoint him to an unpaid advisory position on building commissions in the UK. And this unpaid advisory position was highly controversial when he was put into it. And uh, the, the left just, just came for him. And eventually they really tried to destroy him. And they called him all the names of the age. And uh, fortunately he was uh, able to be, um, uh, his career was, was saved. Um, but they tried everything, they threw everything at him. And I mention that because something very similar happened with Tony Abbott. And by the way, I said something very similar to what I said about the Scruton example with the Abbott example. Last week, the very lazy British broadcast media finally get on to discovering Tony Abbott uh, because there was this rumor that he was going to be involved in British trade negotiations. By the way, I should stress, I admire Tony Abbott enormously. I think he's, he, he uh, is a remarkable politician. I've seen him up close a number of times in Australia and elsewhere. Uh, he is, uh, of course, I mean, anyone who's become a prime minister is, is by nature, this is, you know, to achieve the absolutely top uh, a rank in politics and to think that such a person would be willing to help uh, Britain in trade negotiations being so experienced as he has been in that in Australia and so successful in Australia is something that this country my country Britain should take as an enormous compliment it's something that we uh, I personally have stressed I, I think we, we should be feel very proud and grateful for grateful remember that uh, anyhow uh, uh, of course, uh, the broadcast media uh, doesn't operate like that. It operates on a gotcha uh, paradigm. And a very ignorant uh, journalist from Sky uh, um, News in Britain, which is very different from Sky Australia, uh, Sky News in Britain has become a deeply sort of woke organization, a very, very unwatchable channel. Uh, it has a, a, a presenter called Kay Burley, who the other morning just started accusing uh, um, Tony Abbott of being and we could all sing the song in exactly the same order, so let's do it. He was accused of being a homophobe, of being a misogynist, of being wrong think. Uh, uh, I think she, oh, he's of course a climate change denier. Uh, 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 I don't think she said he was a transphobe, but I'm sure she was gearing up for it. And uh, uh, I watched this with just amazement. At, at, at any journalist being able to embarrass themselves this much. But what was more worrying was that she was doing this to a British minister, in that case, the very weak conservative, Matt Hancock, uh, who was just blustering his way in response. And instead of saying, you know, uh, uh, you're defaming a, a great friend of this country and a great man, uh, uh, sort of said, uh, well, um, uh, he knows about trade and I don't know about the misogyny, homophobia and all these things. But I mean, obviously, homophobia and misogyny is terrible. And, and, and climate change and I was terrible. And, you know, and this is great. So these very weak conservative politicians uh, uh, um, did that for a couple of days. And it sort of caught on. You know, uh, The Guardian, our main left wing propaganda rag in the UK, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's not, not really sound very well. I should stress, by the way, the Spectator magazine outsells The Guardian now. I'm very All right. pleased with that figure, <laughs> figure, by the way. So the failing uh, um, uh, Guardian, you know, ran on its front page, you know, questions over misogynist Abbott trade role. And when, uh, by the way, uh, eventually the British government did uh, uh, um, show that it had some balls and and appointed Tony Abbott, quite rightly, to the, the post they wanted to. But there was clearly a sort of wobble at, at some point on Thursday or Friday. Uh, I made an intervention at The Spectator saying how preposterous this was and saying, as I said with Scruton, by the way, that if you can't uh, appoint Tony Abbott, you can't appoint anyone. You know, if a former prime minister of our closest ally uh, uh, isn't appointable, then no one's appointable. Who, who, who do you think is going gonna, is gonna to make the mark if Tony Abbott doesn't? Well, you know, and how low grade do you want to go? Do you, do you want to find somebody who's never achieved anything in their life and never said anything and has a totally sort of, you know, a clean track record of, 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 you know, of exactly all of 2020's social beliefs and has all, weirdly, somebody who expressed 2020's social beliefs throughout their lives. Um, I mean, these are preposterous demands. 
and uh, and of course in the case of Tony Abbott they're also they were lies that were being spread about him the broadcast media particularly K Burley and Sky News were just broadcasting lies about him they didn't know anything about Tony Abbott and here's the thing and as I, I said uh, in defense not only is it the case that if you can't appoint Tony Abbott to such a role you can't appoint anyone secondly it's deeply ungrateful and dishonest of the British media to act in this way when somebody is doing Britain a favor and an honor to wish to serve and to help this country at a very important moment in our history. But thirdly, I don't give a damn anymore. I am fed up of it, like I think a lot of people. I was, I was fed up of seeing my friend Roger Scruton gone over like this. I'm fed up of seeing Tony Abbott gone over like this. I don't care anymore. As I said, for all I care, Tony Abbott could be a fire-breathing Paisleyite on the issue of sodomy. You know, he could have spent decades walking around with placards like Ian Paisley. Um, I wouldn't care. He could still be the best trade ambassador. And particularly, I don't care when it's dishonest claims saying things like he once said something about women in the late 1990s that Julie Gillard then 12 years ago in order to get herself out of a corner claims means he doesn't like women. I, I don't believe this anymore and we shouldn't believe it and we shouldn't fall for it. But these are, these are like the spell words of our time and they chuck them out at everyone. They did it to Tony Abbott, thank God it didn't work on this occasion. Uh, but they do it to everyone and it's high time that more adults stood up against this and said, no, you don't get to use these rights claims as weapons to beat people with and win a war on dishonest terms. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted this was resolved, but I am very angry still that it was possible for a conservative government to wobble in the face of opposition like this. You know, we have an 80-seat conservative majority in the UK, and sometimes you get the impression that we live under completely Labour Party control. Doug, there's so many discussions arising from your book. We're clearly not going to get through them all. Uh, but let's just encourage people to read the second edition, which has just been published, uh, with the updates on COVID-19. Uh, but your mention of that fine journal, The Spectator, which of course has an Australian edition, reminds me that I recently got censored on, post, on Facebook for posting a piece pointing to a Spectator Australia article. I, I should confess that the piece was by my wife, incidentally, who'd written about the great medical research, including here in Australia, that's being invested in trying to find promising new ways to treat COVID-19 without a vaccine. Vaccine, what, 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 what's so offensive about that? That's very interesting. Uh, uh, you're not the first victim of anti-spectator bias. Um, spectator phobia, one might call it. Um, uh, it's rife in the social media companies, this particular phobia. Uh, I occasionally have readers who write to me and say they've been banned from Facebook for a time or suspended for sharing an article of mine. It always makes me feel absolutely terrible, by the way, because, you know, I, um, I, I, I don't find myself, I feel like somebody who's sort of brought brought unhappiness into another home, you know, brought a problem into somebody else's life. Um, uh, but of course, it's not my fault and it's not the reader's fault, just as like it isn't your fault and it's not your wife's fault. It's the fault of the, of the social media companies. They have, and as you know, in the Madison Crowds, I write a chapter on tech, because uh, mm -hmm. I spent a certain amount of time in Silicon Valley trying to work out what's been going on. Um, tech is doing a lot of things in our lives uh, that we've underestimated. And one of the most striking is, of course, that at this stage, the tech companies are finding themselves doing something that I don't think they did ex anticipate, they should have anticipated, but I don't think they did anticipate, which is that they ended up having to be, in their view, a sort of censor, or a, uh, they had to end up behaving like publishers behave, a, a decider of what is acceptable in their publication. Now, by the way, this is a basically impossible task if you're Facebook, because there's too much material. It's not like editing a magazine or a newspaper, millions and millions of people are on the platform, and you just can't do it. I mean, I think it's a sort of fool's errand. And I, I, my own view is that the social media companies can make sure that illegal things do not go on, i.e., you, you, you know, you can't put 
uh, bomb making manuals on social media. Uh, but but what they've done consistently is to go for everything a step below that and then a step below that. And there are several reasons for that, I should stress. The first is a very practical one. Silicon Valley is, and the, the uh, people who are the sort of content checkers are almost unanimously like everyone else in Silicon Valley from the political left and the political far left. Uh, this isn't just anecdotal, this has been uh, demonstrated. Uh, um, uh, the Obama administration, uh, when, uh, they, when the uh, Democrats lost in America, all those people who worked for Obama went to Silicon Valley. Same in the UK, Liberal Democrat leader Nick Clegg, former Deputy Prime Minister, failed as a politician in the UK, immediately gets hoovered up by Facebook and becomes one of their chief you know, officers and, and then brings in all of his failed third and fourth rate low grade ruddy Lib Dem MP and and Lib Dem friends to come and work at Facebook. See, so the people who, who want to decide what you and I and everyone else can know and say and read are all of the political left, without exception. There is no, there, there's even less right wingery in uh, 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 Silicon Valley than there is in academia these days. And so these decisions are all made by the left. And, and what's more, they're ignorant. They're wildly ignorant. They're kids. I mean, this is one amazing thing. I sometimes think when you see censorship debates in Silicon Valley, I sometimes think these are people who've never read anything. They don't know that we've had all of these debates many times before in our history. We had them in England in the 17th century. We had them in England and elsewhere in the 19th and 18th centuries. We've had them in the 20th century repeatedly. Facebook and others behave as if we've never had these debates about censorship and they have actually taken upon themselves the decision to, for instance, decide what people can or cannot say about COVID. That's how you get into this preposterous situation that you and your wife are in, where, where uh, 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 the oldest running magazine in the English language, The Spectator, can run a piece, but Facebook a new, relatively new, I mean, a real, you know, upstart by spectator standards, upstart company of, uh, um, of, of, I don't know, what is it, now, 20 years standing, thinks it can decide that the spectator's content isn't uh, uh, reproducible. Well, for hell with these people. We need to cause a much bigger uh, fuss about it. It's outrageous that they think they can limit the, the uh, remits of the debate. They know, in my experience, far less than the average member of the public on these matters. Their so-called experts are no such thing. They desire to limit debate. They desire to have a, a, um, a power and do have a power which is deeply, deeply disturbing because in my opinion, absolutely nobody at Facebook or any of these companies is remotely qualified to decide what you or I or anyone watching can know. Absolutely none of them. Uh, they're not qualified. They're not knowledgeable enough. They're not grown up enough. They're just out of short pants. And uh, uh, this has got to be a much, much bigger scandal because these people have too much power and it has to be taken away from them one way or the other. Well, as you say, Douglas, to hell with a lot of them. Let's celebrate the positive things about modern technology, like the ability to have conversations with great people like you. Uh, and it's the next best thing to having you here. Uh, and let's hope we can start lifting these border restrictions soon and get you back. It would be great to be back with you, I tell you. Thanks very much for joining us. Oh, it's a huge pleasure and best to everyone there.